in this session on behalf of the Science Festival. This is the Ada Loveday, Lovelace Day talk for the Sidmouth Science Festival. Those of you who've been before know we, we hold on these talks every year. Um, normally we'd be in Kennaway House meeting face to face and physically, but this is by no means a normal year. And so whilst we're um, missing the physical interaction, you know, we're very pleased to be able to hold this event online, event, in fact, all the events of the Science Festival. Um, just a couple of remarks before we, we start. Um, staging the festival, even an online festival, just costs some money. Um, so we're extremely grateful to all of the sponsors of the Science Festival this year. You can see those on the bottom of the screen that's in front of you. Um, I'd especially like to mention that this particular talk is sponsored by the, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, um, Devon and Somerset, you know, who sponsor this event. So particular thanks to them as well. Um, if you're able and willing to make a personal donation, then although we haven't got the orange buckets to shake, there is a, it is possible to make a do donation online on the festival website. And we're obviously extremely grateful for any donations that we receive. Um, hopefully there'll be time for some questions at the end. Um, we've managed this quite successfully by using the chat box function on Zoom. So please type in the questions as they occur to you during Nicola's talk. And then I'll try and um, you know, distill those together for some Q&As at the end, which uh, between myself and Nicola. Um, thanks for all, uh, muting your audio and video. And um, please keep it muted if you could do you know, through, through, through the session. Um, Ada Lovelace Day celebrates the achievements of women in science, engineering, technology and maths. So, so we're very especially pleased today to welcome Nicola, Nicola Graham Slaw, who's going to give us a talk on the engineering to conserve the SS Great Britain. Um, you may have seen a short bio for Nicola on our website, um, and that amongst many other achievements that are, that are listed down there, that in 2018 Nicola was appointed to be the first SS Great Britain conservation engineer. So extremely well qualified, I'm sure, to give this talk, which I'm very much looking forward to, and I'm sure we all are. So Nicola, over to you now, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I, um, so I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll swap. Um, we can just swap your slides for mine. Has that worked how it did when we practiced it? Perfect. All good. OK, great. Um, so thank you very much for having me and um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm really sorry not to have been able to come to Sidmouth um, because I love the South Coast, but uh, I'm here live from Bristol today um, to tell you a bit about the engineering story of one of the city's most recognisable landmarks um, and one of the city's uh, top tourist attractions, which is the SS Great Britain. Now, Engineering, as, as we probably already know, is a really central part of the ship's design. Um, and I'll cover in a minute some of the um, engineering achievements which were unlocked with the de design of the ship. Um, but also engineering is a part of a really important part of the phenomenal work which got the ship back to Bristol um, and transformed her into the amazing asset that she is today. So she's an asset to the city um, and she's an asset to the engineering profession as well. Um, so a lot of the work that we do at the ship um, is around trying to um, inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers um, and having the story of the ship and having the stories of, um, of Brunel and all of the other tech that's um, gone into the ship and into um, Bristol um, are really powerful stories for us to have to inspire the engineers of the future. Um, so I'll also give you a little look behind the scenes at the work that we do to keep that legacy going, um, which is the work that I've got the immense privilege of being able to be a part of. So our story starts in the 1830s with probably one of the world's best known engineers. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this man, um, but for the benefit of anyone who isn't, um, I kind of think of Brunel as being a bit like the Elon Musk of the 19th century. Um, he was a really ambitious engineer, but he was also really ambitious as an entrepreneur. Um, he understood the value of networking and he understood the importance of his public profile. He really cared very deeply about what people thought of him um, because he knew that that was really important to being able to get his project achieved. Um, he also prided himself on being able to do 
not only things that have never been done before, but also things that people thought couldn't be done. Brunel started his career as a civil engineer and one of his greatest early career successes um, was his work as the chief engineer on the Great Western Railway, which runs from London to Bristol. Brunel designed a lot of the infrastructure on the railway, things like the stations, the bridges and the tunnels. So there are some uh, well-known parts of the Great Western Railway, um, which Brunel was the chief engineer to design. Now, the Great Western Steamship Company was set up to extend the steam powered transport beyond Bristol. And for the first time ever, it was able to provide powered transport all the way from London to New York. Now, it had been possible to sail to New York in the past, um, but this was by the power of sail. So um, by converting a steamship, so by, convert uh, by building a steamship, um, you were able to travel all the way from London to Bristol and then to New York on a timetable, which is something that hadn't been possible before. So to achieve this, they needed to combine two technologies. They needed to combine a steam engine and they needed to combine an ocean ship, um, which, as I just said, is something that had never been done before. And it was Brunel's knowledge and his connections within the engineering industry, um, which allowed these kind of two disciplines to be combined in this way. Um, and this unlocked not only a new engineering achievement, um, but it also unlocked kind of a new, um, a new social and a new um, societal benefit. Because for the first time, not only could you travel to New York on a timetable, um, but you could also know, know when your post was going to arrive. Um, so it was the first mechanised transport, transport across any ocean. Um, and it was a significant step for global communication as well as for engineering. So the SS Great Western was a really big commercial and technical success. Um, and as you might expect, the Great Western Steamship Company decided that they wanted to build another ship so that they could make even more money from this booming trade. But we've just talked about Brunel a bit and Brunel was not interested in building another one the same. He didn't want to do the same thing again. That, that's not the sort of thing that he did. He wanted to do something different. He wanted to do something bigger and something better because he knew that the second ship could be more profitable if it could be made bigger. Um, but then there was a technical problem associated with this. Um, and that's that the material, which is wood, wouldn't be up to the job structurally. So the SS Great Western um, was a wooden paddle steamer and she was already over 70 meters long, which is pretty big for a wooden ship. And Brunel knew that a wooden ship any longer than this um, would be too bendy to survive on the stormy Atlantic. So I've chosen this picture because it kind of gives, a, um, gives an impression of, of exactly how much she would have been um, thrown around by the Atlantic Ocean. You know, it's a, it's a big ocean, there are big storms. Um, and Brunel was concerned that um, wood just wouldn't stand up to it structurally. Um, so he knew that if he wanted to build a bigger ship, he would need to build it out of iron. Um, which is a material that had been used in the past for smaller river and canal vessels, but it, it had never been used for an ocean ship. So to achieve this, Brunel used his structural engineering experience, designing those railway bridges, the tunnels and the stations, to design the structure of the ship. Um, so if you visit the SS Great Britain, one of the things you notice when you're in the forward hold is that there's this kind of box girder construction which runs all the way along the bottom of the ship. Um, and that kind of gives it extra strength along its length, um, as well as the hull itself being made from wrought iron. Now, during the construction of the ship, Brunel also um, saw another new idea. He saw the demonstration of a new technology, um, which was a screw propeller. So the picture I've got on the screen here, um, you can see in the middle of the ship, you can see um, the paddle wheels, and that's how the ship was propelled. Um, so inside those two big wheels on the sides of the ship, um, you'd have paddles that went round and they would kind of scoop up water as they went and that's how the ship would go forward. Um, but if you imagine this ship being thrown around in the ocean, um, one of the issues you had with paddle wheels is how high up um, on the ship they were. So um, the advantage that a screw propeller offered, or one of them anyway, was that it was at, at the stern of the ship at the bottom. Um, so it was under the water all of the time. Um, which mean, meant it was a much more efficient way of making a ship move forward than paddle wheels would have been. So Brunel was so excited by this idea when he saw it that he ordered the construction of the SS Great Britain to be put on hold 
uh, while he researched the idea and then he persuaded the company directors that the SS Great Britain should have a propeller instead of having paddle wheels. So as well as being the first iron ship, she was also the first ocean vessel to use a screw propeller. Um, so we've got kind of two steps forward um, in terms of engineering here. Um, so another advantage that the screw propeller offers um, which turned out to be really significant was that it meant that the engine no longer had to be right in the middle of the ship. Um, your engine could be tucked out of the way at the bottom and that freed up valuable space in, in the biggest part of the ship in the centre and um, which you could use for passengers and which you could use for cargo. Um, although I have to say that Brunel's engine, uh, Brunel's engine was designed in a bit of a hurry and was actually very space inefficient. Um, but the future, engine, uh, future engines rather that were um, used for the SS Great Britain were much more compact and this meant that later in her life she had a lot more space to carry cargo and to carry passengers. So amongst engineers the SS Great Britain is kind of widely regarded as being the world's first great ocean liner um, and, and widely acknowledged as being the common ancestor or the great great grandmother of every ship that is afloat today. And as well as being a significant engineering advancement, the SS Great Britain um, also had her own impact on international communication. She started life as a luxury passenger liner between Bristol and New York, um, but unfortunately this was cut short because after just three years, a, nav a navigation error ran her aground and left her beached in Northern Ireland. But it was because of her iron hull and her structural strength that she was able to survive this ordeal. And she survived on the beach with the pounding waves for almost a year and many unsuccessful rescue attempts before she was finally refloated. And any wooden vessel in this situation would have broken to pieces. Unfortunately, this event bankrupted the Great Western Steamship Company and they were forced to sell the ship for less than she cost to salvage. So that was the end of the Great Western Steamship Company. The SS Great Britain, on the other hand, survived and went on to enjoy a long and successful working life. She was refitted by her new owners and she went on to become the fastest and the most comfortable way to emigrate to Australia. Um, and this was during the gold rush that she was refitted. Um, so business was booming. And our research at the Trust estimates that around half a million people living in Australia today are there because their ancestors emigrated on this ship. So in terms of global impact and global communication, even though the company that designed her had gone bankrupt, um, she survived and she went on then to have a, an even bigger impact. Later on in her life, she was converted to a sailing ship and then into a floating warehouse before finally um, she became not commercially viable anymore. So she became too expensive to keep watertight and too expensive to keep floating. Um, and finally, she was scuttled and abandoned in Sparrow Cove, which is in the Falkland Islands, in 1937. So that's an impressive 94-year career, um, during which she sailed more than one million nautical miles. So we've got all of her voyage logs um, in our collection here at the SS Great Britain Trust. Abandoned and forgotten for more than 30 years then, um, a crack had developed in her side, and the daily tides meant that the salt from the water and the oxygen from the air um, were kind of churning up together and had perfect access to the hull and to the internal ironwork. Um, and what that does is it creates ideal conditions for corrosion, which we'll come back to in more detail in a minute. And the ship was forgotten about during the late 30s <clears throat> and almost lost forever until in the 1960s, a naval architect called Dr. Ewan Corlett found out about the story of the ship. And he couldn't believe that such an important piece of engineering history had been abandoned and forgotten about. So he did what anyone who was passionate about a cause did in the 60s, and he wrote a letter to the editor of the Times. Now, Dr. Corlett was a naval architect, which is a branch of engineering which deals with the design of ships' hulls. So obviously he was very interested in this ship. And he himself was a, a very accomplished engineer, um, he had a successful consultancy firm and he had quite a high standing in the Royal Institution of Naval Architects. He'd already carried out quite a lot of research into the significance and the likely condition of the ship. Following on from his letter to the Times, he managed to assemble a team and he managed to raise some funds to survey the ship and to attempt to salvage her. Now the first job 
uh, was to get the ship floating again after more than 30 years on the seabed. So they sent some divers down to have a look and to plug up any holes that they found in the bottom of the ship. So both the scuttling holes and any other holes that had opened up during the time she'd been there. A big door had been cut in one side of the ship during the days that she was being used as a floating warehouse. Um, and this had created a um, basically like a, a structural fault, which then opened up a crack in the whole of the starboard side of the ship um, when they first tried to, um, to refloat her, which you can see in the picture here. So they sent out an appeal on the local radio asking people in the Falkland Islands to donate their unwanted old mattress to stuff inside the crack. Um, and using contributions from the locals, they were able to, um, to patch up the crack and uh, patch up the other holes. Um, and then once they'd done that, they were able to pump as much water as they could out of the ship um, and eventually get her afloat again. So to get her back to Bristol then, they'd hired a submersible pontoon, which is basically just a hollow metal box. Um, and how that works is that you, when your box is empty, it floats. And when your box is full of water, it sinks. Um, so what you have to do is you have to fill your box. So you fill your pontoon with water to sink it. Um, and then you have to maneuver it underneath the ship once you've got the ship afloat. Um, and then once you've got the pontoon lined up underneath the ship, you can tie it all together. Um, and then you pump the water back out of the pontoon and you hope that the whole thing floats again. And once you've got it set up like that, you can then attach it to a tug. Um, and then she was towed more than 8,000 miles back to Avonmouth, which is the port just outside Bristol. So the River Avon, though, is too narrow and too bendy for anything like this um, to be able to, to get up. So once the ship got back to Avonmouth, she needed to have some more substantial repairs so that she could float on her own hull for long enough to get back into the city. Um, now, what I really love about this picture is that this is the only time ever that the SS Great Britain has been under the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Um, and the reason for that is because although Brunel designed the Clifton Suspension Bridge, um, the project actually ran out of money. So the bridge was not completed until after his death. Um, and the SS Great Britain actually sailed from Liverpool for most of her working life. Um, so this is a really special day when the SS Great Britain came um, back up the River Avon. Um, and it was actually on the, um, actually in July 1970. So we've just celebrated our 50th anniversary this year. Um, unfortunately, we had to celebrate, uh, we had to cancel our big party. So we're going to have a 51st birthday party next year. Um, but 50, 50 years ago this year, um, the SS Great Britain came back up the River Avon, um, having come 8,000 miles from the Falkland Islands, um, and was put back into um, the Great Western Dry Dock. Um, which was actually the same dock that she was built in. And on the first day back in Bristol, there were a queue of 2,000 visitors lined up to come and visit her. So for the next 20 years or so, the SS Great Britain project lived a bit of a hand-to-mouth existence, um, and the ship was cared for more or less as a working ship would have been, or as much as they could anyway. Um, but they were mostly made up of volunteers, um, there were some naval architects and there were some other um, ship enthusiasts, some Brunel enthusiasts, and they had some help from the commercial ship, shipyard next door as well. So the iron hull was cared for in a similar way to how a working ship would be. Um, it was repaired, it was patched up, and it was pressure washed to get rid of any old rust and dirt, um, dried, and then it was painted with a lead oxide paint, which is um, something which protects the iron from oxygen and moisture. However, um, because of the age of the ship, this wasn't enough to keep her clean. And the project were fighting a bit of a losing battle against corrosion. So I said I'd come back to corrosion in a minute, and here it is. Um, so corrosion is a name that we give to a chemical reaction which takes place between a material, usually a metal, um, and its environment. So in the specific case of iron, um, it's more commonly known as rust, which is a word that if you, if you haven't heard about corrosion, then you almost certainly know what I mean by rust. So in the presence of water, iron from the metal reacts with oxygen from the air to form iron oxide, which is kind of like a brittle brown material, um, which is much less strong than, than the iron was. Um, so it flakes off, it falls off the metal surface, which then exposes the next layer of iron to the air and the water, um, and this process repeats. Um, so you get kind of the gradual wasting away of, of the iron, which obviously isn't good news if the iron is part of your structure. So to make matters worse, 
Um, if you leave iron in salt water, um, you get another chemical reaction, which is where chlorides from the salt become embedded in the structure of the iron. Um, and this basically um, attracts water to the metal, um, which acts to accelerate corrosion. So um, you end up with even faster corrosion in the presence of salt. Um, now to overcome this problem, um, engineers have developed materials called alloys. Um, so you will have heard of, um, there are some common names for some of them. So for example, stainless steel, everybody's heard of that one. Um, and so in stainless steel, by mixing the iron with other elements, um, you can change the material properties. Um, and by doing that, you can make it more resistant to corrosion. So engineers work with different combinations of elements and by doing that, they can make different properties for their metals. Um, but in, 18, in the 1840s, um, this wasn't really something that Brunel knew about or this wasn't, this wasn't something that had been developed. So um, he had wrought iron, which was very susceptible to corrosion. Um, so with salt involved in the equation as well, even the tiny amounts of oxygen and water that are within the impurities in the iron are enough to cause corrosion from the inside. So it doesn't matter how well you seal up the surface of the iron, um, you're going to still get this corrosion reaction. Um, and once the SS Great Britain was out of the sea, um, the part of the ship where the chlorides had accumulated, um, so that would be the part of the ship which was in the water when she was in the sea, so the lower part of the hull, um, she was in the dry dock which was drained and they suddenly had access to just the right amounts of moisture and oxygen for the corrosion process to accelerate and to become very aggressive. So with the combination of material loss from corrosion and the changed loading that the ship was under, so the other thing that we need to remember, when you take a ship out of water, um, when she's in the water, she's designed to have a nice, even, compressive load um, all the way around the hull. Um, but when you take her out of the water, um, suddenly there are parts of the ship that are designed to be in compression that are in tension and vice versa. Um, and um, ships are designed to be able to withstand this for short amounts of time while they're repaired and maintained, um, but not for many, many decades at a time. So this combination of the uh, degradation of the material and the change in loading on the ship um, meant that the SS Great Britain um, was estimated by experts to have uh, less than 20 years left before she would be structurally unsafe for visitors. So caring for the ship as a working ship wasn't working um, and something needed to change. So when you're working with a historic object, um, this is one of the things I found really interesting um, in my kind of move from traditional engineering into looking after heritage objects. Um, every, every object is kind of unique. You very rarely get many that are the same. Um, and so conservation has to be as well. Everything's kind of done on a case by case basis. Um, and it's such a wide ranging profession um, with skills that come from lots of different arts and sciences disciplines um, that kind of all get brought together. And to me, that makes it really interesting. So when we're conserving a museum object, um, we have to make decisions on an object by object basis. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to preserve whatever it is about that object which makes it special. Um, and that varies, of course, depending on the object's story and depending on the object's history. Um, and what makes the SS Great Britain so special um, is two things. First of all, the propeller. Um, and secondly, um, is the material and the structure. So the, Brunel's original propeller uh, barely lasted five minutes. That's long gone. So we, we couldn't conserve that even if we wanted to. Um, so what we've got left is the iron hull. And we've got Brunel's original material and we've got Brunel's original structure. So the conservation strategy for the SS Great Britain is centered around preserving that original material. And to do that, we have to find a way to stop this aggressive chloride accelerated corrosion. So going back to the corrosion reaction, um, for the reaction to take place, we need three things to be present with the iron. We need um, chlorides from the salt, uh, we need oxygen and we need water. So if we can remove any one of those three things, then we can stop the reaction and we can protect the iron. Scientists are now working on ways to remove chlorides, but most of the methods that we know about need the metal to be submerged in a solution of some description, um, which isn't practical for a 100 meter long ship in a porous grade two listed dry dock. 
Um, and then on top of that, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, these techniques were not as well developed as they were today. So the um, conservation science community didn't have the knowledge that they've got today about um, removing chlorides from iron. Um, so that wasn't an option. Uh, we can remove oxygen by putting the metal in some sort of sealed space with an inert gas, um, which would stop the corrosion process. Um, but one of the other requirements that we have is that um, in order for this project to be financially viable, we have to have visitors able to enjoy the ship. Um, and if we remove, remove oxygen from the ship's environment, that's not compatible with visitors enjoying the ship. Um, so we can't have people in if we haven't got oxygen. Um, so that just leaves water. Um, and I don't mean rain. Um, so even the air inside in, in a kind of average room in a house contains water. Um, but the amount of water in the air or its relative humidity can vary. So um, inside a modern building, the relative humidity might be about 50%. Um, but outside in Bristol, it's typically around 80%. And in fact, it gets into the 90s uh, many times of year. So the team needed to do some experiments to determine just how dry that air would have to get to overcome the presence of the chlorides and slow down the corrosion process. Um, so we teamed up with the University of Cardiff and we did some experiments. Um, so what we did is we made some samples of the iron and we made some samples of the types of chloride compounds that were present in the iron. Um, and we sealed them inside a controlled environment and we put them on a really accurate scale. Um, so the corrosion rate um, can be measured by um, the corrosion rate can be measured by um, observing the increase in mass of the sample as the oxygen the oxygen from the air becomes part of the solid on the scale rather than the oxygen molecules zipping around as part of the air in there. So you've got iron on the scale, um, and then as that reacts with oxygen in the air to become iron oxide, um, the oxygen is no longer in the air, instead it becomes part of a solid. So you actually get an, in an increase in mass. Um, so if you set up one of these experiments and you start your stopwatch, um, then the weight of your sample or the mass of your sample will go up with time. Um, so the curve that I've put on the screen now, um, I'm going to click and add a label to it, but um, probably my face is in the way, so um, you, you might not be able to see. Um, this curve is at 35% relative humidity. So this is kind of the sort of relative humidity that you might get um, in a room with central heating uh, in the kind of autumn or winter. So that's kind of typical of what, what you might get in a museum or a conference hall or something like that um, in the winter. So what we needed to do was we needed to work out how dry the air needed to be before when we started our stopwatch, uh, we didn't get any increase in mass from the sample. So that would tell us that we weren't getting any oxygen being added to the iron from the air, so we weren't getting any iron oxide. Um, and by repeating this experiment, um, our colleagues at Cardiff University determined that it needed to be 20% relative humidity. So we had a target, 20% relative humidity, um, and that suggests that we've managed to stop the corrosion if we can get the air that dry. Um, so at this point, I kind of need to give you a bit of a feel for what 20% relative humidity feels like, because, you know, that's just a number. Um, so if we want to find somewhere that's naturally this dry, we literally have to go to the desert. And we're not the first engineers to think of this. You've probably seen pictures like this one or footage of aircraft being stored in the Arizona desert for precisely this reason. So the very dry atmosphere means that engineers don't need to worry about parts of the metal corroding before they can be re repaired or reused or recycled. But the Arizona desert is a very different atmosphere to the dry dock in Bristol. Um, so the engineers needed to then, the next challenge for the engineers then were to, was to design a system which could recreate this kind of atmosphere in Bristol. So if we're going to try and create 20% relative humidity, first of all, we need to understand a bit better what this means. <clears throat> um, if you open up a thermodynamics textbook um, and you look up a definition of relative humidity, um, you'll get something like this. So it's the partial pressure of water in the atmosphere um, as a proportion of the equilibrium vapor pressure. And you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to use any of those words again. Um, I'm going to um, simplify it slightly. 
Um, and there's an approximation that we can use, um, which is not quite technically correct, but it's close enough. Um, so what relative humidity is, um, is it's a measure of the amount of water in the air as a proportion of the capacity that that air has got to hold water in it. Um, and the other important thing to remember about this is that the bottom half of that fraction, so how much moisture the air can hold, um, is a function of temperature. So the hotter your air is, um, the more water it can, it can kind of hold in it um, as vapour. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of examples um, and then hopefully it will be, um, be kind of re reasonably obvious how this works. So if I've got a sealed box um, and it's at 50% relative humidity um, and no water molecules can get in or out, so I've got the same number of water molecules um, and I increase the temperature, um, the relative humidity in that box will decrease even though the water molecules can't go anywhere. And that's because the capacity of the air in that box to hold those water molecules has increased. Um, and the same in reverse. So if I take, um, so here's, here's the most kind of obvious example that you would see around your house. Um, so if I had um, a warm room with um, a bit of moisture in it, and I were to take a cold surface, then what would happen is that the air right next to that surface would decrease in temperature. And as the air decreases in temperature, the relative humidity increases um, until eventually the relative humidity reaches 100%. And at that point, um, the air can't hold the moisture um, as vapor anymore. So the, the vapor condenses out and you end up with liquid water. Um, and Obviously, condensation on a cold drink, even if, you know, even if the bottle of water is um, closed, so it's not water from inside the bottle, it's water from the air. Um, and it's come out because the relative humidity of that air has gone up to 100%. And this is also the reason why um, on a cold morning you might see um, dew or you might see water on the grass, even if it hasn't rained the night before. And this principle is how most domestic dehumidifiers work. So if I was going to design a domestic dehumidifier, um, you start off with a long pipe um, and you fold it up or you coil it up and that gives it lots of surface area. Um, and then you chill down a fluid um, and you pump it through the pipe. And what that does is it makes the surface of the pipe cold. Um, and then you would blow your air um, over the surface of the cold pipe. Um, and as the air cooled down, as it, as it goes past the pipe, um, you get the water coming out of it and you get water condensing, you get condensation on the pipe um, and then you can drain that water away um, and then the air that leaves the device um, is drier because it's had the, the moisture physically removed from it. So if you were an engineer and you were going to design something like this, um, one of the things you would need to know is how cold you need to get the surface of the pipe to get that water to condense. Um, and we call that the dew point, which again is a phrase that um, I'm sure you've all heard before. So the dew point is basically the temperature of a surface which will cause condensation to happen. And for the air in a room or maybe outside, um, I would generally expect it to be um, between about five and 10 degrees C. Um, and again, this is why on a cold night you get wet grass, even if it hasn't rained, um, or you sometimes get water um, collecting on the inside of a single glazed window. And that's because the surface of the window gets cold enough um, to cause condensation. Um, so what you can then do is you can, um, there are a number of tables and you can look up what the dew point is for air at different conditions. So if you've got your air at 20% relative humidity um, and you were to open up the relevant textbook, you would get a graph that looks like this. Um, and this presents us with a bit of an issue because um, if you've got air at 20 degrees C and 20% relative humidity, um, the temperature that your pipe needs to be to cause condensation is minus 4 degrees C. Um, which presents us with a bit of a problem because that's below the freezing point of the water. So if I could get a fluid through those pipes at minus 4 degrees C, um, that would technically be possible. There are, there are other fluids that freeze at colder temperatures than water. Um, and you would get condensation on the pipes. So the condensation would freeze, um, which then means that you can't drain it away. So you've got um, all of this moisture that you then can't get rid of. Um, so this technique of removing moisture from air doesn't work when you get that dry. 
Um, so we have to find another way to remove the moisture from the air if we want to get it as dry as the Arizona desert. And you've almost certainly seen one of these before. So this is a, um, a silica gel desiccant. Um, and a sachet like this um, is, is basically like a sponge in that it absorbs moisture from any air that it comes into contact with. And you've probably seen these sachets in packaging with things like electronics, or even if you buy a pair of trainers, if you buy it online, um, you open up the box and you'll probably find a little paper sachet in there with whatever you've ordered. Um, and the reason for that is that that means any excess moisture can be absorbed from inside the box. Um, and that stops your shoes from getting moldy and it stops your electronics from getting water damaged while they're in the warehouse and while they're being delivered. So we could use this technique. We could fill the space around the ship with some sort of desiccant, um, but this would be pretty high maintenance because we'd need quite a lot of it. Um, and we'd also need to change it regularly. Um, so what we do instead is we basically make um, a giant desiccant sachet. So we've got a really big desiccant sachet. Um, and what we do is we use it like a filter. So we force air through it. Um, and by doing that, we can remove the moisture from the air and then we deliver the air to the metal rather than taking the desiccant to the metal. Um, so this slide has just got some pictures showing what sort of scale um, we're talking about. So we've got two of these um, kind of big desiccant blocks um, and each one is made up of four of these wedges and each wedge takes two or three people to lift. So, so that's the, the scale that we're talking about um, to, to um, dry enough air for a hundred meter long iron ship. So once we've been forcing air through our desiccant for a little while, um, the material is going to be collecting moisture and eventually it's going to get saturated. So it can't, um, it can't absorb moisture forever. Um, so we need to find a way to, to recharge it. Um, but from what we know about how humidity varies with temperature, um, we know that we can recharge this desiccant by then sending hot air through it in the other direction. So what we've got is we've got um, a filter made from desiccant and we can put air through it in one direction to dry the air and that takes the air to the ship um, and then we dry the ship. And then we know that we can also put air through it in the other direction and the air coming in the second direction, we get that really hot um, and then it kind of collects moisture as it goes through the desiccant. Um, and then you'll notice that the desiccant, once you've put your wedges together, um, it makes a round shape. And what we do is we slowly turn that. Um, so by turning it, what we're doing is we're moving it between the two different streams of air. So I've, I've got a bit of a diagram on the next slide. So at the top, you can see you've got your air that comes from the ship um, it gets dried and then it goes back to the ship. So the, the top cycle of air um, is the very dry air. Um, and then the bottom cycle of air um, is the hot air. So um, by adding heat to air from outside, we can then use that to strip moisture back out of the desiccant. Um, and then we exhaust that air back to outside again. So um, if you walk past the ship on a cold day, occasionally you'll see a big puff of steam coming from the, um, coming from the dry dock. Um, and, and that's just the desiccant being recharged. So that's us taking the moisture out of the desiccant. Um, and this sets up a continuous process. Um, so we can then just run this 24 seven. So we will then attach humidity sensors to the surface of the ship. And what that does is it tells us, um, it tells us how much heat we need to be putting into this system at any one time um, to make sure that we're removing enough moisture um, to be able to keep the ship dry enough. Um, so when you've got a 100 meter long object, um, if you turn the heat up, you start taking moisture out of the desiccant. Um, but because, because your object is so big and because your system is so big, there's a bit of a time delay um, between the heat going up and the ship actually getting drier. Um, so what we need to do is we need to come up with a control algorithm which can kind of take this into account and can, um, can um, anticipate the, um, the air getting too damp and therefore add heat at the correct time. So our next challenge then, once we've got our air dry enough, is to seal the metal into this dehumidified space. And using what we know about the iron, the engineers were able to come up with um, a way to do this. So we know from that the chlorides from the seawater are what causes the corrosion to be so aggressive. 
So what if we could isolate just the parts of the ship that have been under the sea? Um, so the engineers to achieve this designed a glass plate which sits over the dry dock um, and it sits at the level that the water would have been on the ship when she was afloat. Um, so what we've got is we've created a sealed space which contains just the parts of the ship that really need it. Um, so we aren't wasting any extra en energy dehumidifying um, the parts of the iron that don't have the high salt concentration. So for the top half of the ship, we've got a good airtight layer of paint, um, which is enough to protect the metal um, because we don't have all that salt. Um, but then underneath the part of the ship that was um, under the water um, during her working life, um, is full of salt, so we need to keep that at 20% relative humidity. So to complete this part of the design, the engineers flooded the glass plate with a thin layer of water, um, which adds some insulation, and it also creates this visual effect of the ship about to sail. So from far away, it looks like the ship is floating in the water, but then when you actually get up close, you'll see um, that underneath the layer of water is in fact a dry area. Um, so we have the dry dock, which is basically a big hole in the ground, which is designed for building and repairing ships. Um, and the Great Western dry dock was built on quite soft and, and wet ground. So it's quite a, um, it's quite, it's quite a soft structure. Um, but because it was built for the SS Great Britain, that gives it this historic significance. So it's actually a grade two listed structure. Um, so even even with our dehumidifiers, um, what we actually get is still water coming through the, um, coming through the walls because they're a bit porous. Um, so we need to find another way underneath the ship to, get, to keep the damp air away from the ship. Um, so underneath the ship, we've got, if you look along the, um, the keel of the ship, I don't know why I'm pointing, you can't see. Um, uh, if you look along the keel of the ship you can see um, you've got a duct which has got all of these nozzles um, and what we do with this is we basically are creating like an invisible curtain of dried air um, which flows over the surface of the metal um, and then it gets sucked back into the dehumidifier to be recirculated so even even in this sealed space um, we're not achieving 20% relative humidity everywhere we're only needing to achieve 20% relative humidity um, in the layer of air which is right next to the metal surface of the ship um, and this is basically the the only way like by by utilizing this kind of curtain effect is the only way that it's viable to um, to create um, an atmosphere that dry um, over a big enough space for the ship because it's quite um, it's quite an energy intensive thing to do um, so this is a way that we can kind of keep that energy requirement manageable um, the idea is that that very dry air goes over the surface of the ship and then it goes back into the system and it doesn't mix with any, any of the moisture that seeps through the dry dock walls. So finally, a team of structural engineers did some calculations on the ship's hull um, to take into account the corrosion which had already happened. Um, and by doing this, they were able to build an internal skeleton um, which supports the worst affected parts of the ship. Um, so what that does then is it... Um, transfers the damaging tensile loads from the brittle corroded iron um, to modern steel elements which are hidden inside the ship. Um, so this combination of stopping the corrosion and reinforcing the ship's structure, um, by doing that the engineers were able to um, extend the predicted life of the ship's structure. So um, I think I said earlier on that um, it was estimated to be 20 or 25 years. Um, so our, our new estimate now is that um, we think it's got 100 years um, and it will be structurally stable for 100 years. <coughs> so to design this system um, required lots of different types of engineers to all come together. Um, the mechanical engineers decided how the pumps and the fans should be positioned. The electrical engineers installed the controls and the sensors. The software engineers wrote the, the code to control the system. Um, the civil engineers built a new dam at the dry dock entrance. Um, the structural engineers designed the supports for the ship um, and so on. And it's this application of skills from across different professions and different disciplines um, that has allowed the SS Great Britain to survive. Um, much in the same way that Brunel's 
transfer of skills and knowledge from his time building railway bridges um, was what made the ship remarkable enough in the first place um, to be to still exist and to still be worth conserving. Um, so it's now been almost 20 years since this system was designed and a couple of years ago um, an opportunity came up at the SS Great Britain Trust um, to fundraise for a new engineer to join the team to look after this system. The system had been designed by a team of engineers, um, but they were all consultants and contractors, um, and each individual piece of equipment had been maintained by various different contractors, um, and the curatorial staff and the technical services team at the SS Great Britain had been monitoring the condition of the visible parts of the metal, um, but there hadn't been any ownership of the system as a whole. Um, so that was the reason why they wanted to bring in a conservation engineer. Um, which is my job. Now I don't have any prior experience in conservation um, and I don't have any prior experience in shipkeeping. Um, my original specialism is um, basically the flow of um, gases around spaces um, and I spent the first part of my career working out how to use gas cooling to keep nuclear reactors running safely. Um, so I worked on um, the AGR fleet which is uh, stands for Advanced Gas Cooled Reactor. Um, so these are all reactors that were built in the 80s and 90s um, and mostly were due to have been decommissioned by now but they're all still running um, and the reason they're still running is because they have these teams of engineers whose job it basically is um, to assess anything that goes on um, on the reactors so anything that the sensors pick up um, and to um, kind of use that information um, to calculate and then to come up with all of the scientific proof that these reactors are still safe to run. So that was my job for the first um, 10 years or so of my career. Um, and it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, seems like a bit of a change of path, but there's a surprising amount in common um, between the ship and uh, between working on the AGR fleet. Um, the, so, uh, one of the one of the really interesting things about the AGR fleet is that even though they're um, even though they're nominally all built to similar designs, um, each one has got a very slightly different operating history, um, and that affects how they are today. Um, so there are each one has kind of got its own quirks, and each one has got its own personality. Um, and in the same way, when you're dealing with historic objects, you have to tailor your approach. Um, to what you know about the object. You have to build up this understanding of the object's history, um, and not only how it's been modified in the past in, in, the, um, in the case of conservation, but why it is important and exactly what you're trying to conserve and, and why. Um, and so I found that interestingly, there are quite a lot of parallels between the way of thinking in, um, in the two jobs. So um, in my first year as the conservation engineer here at the SS Great Britain, um, one of the things I did was a complete review of the system to try and understand how the dehumidifier and the airflows, the sensors and the software all work together um, and making a few changes to improve the reliability and the performance of the system as a whole. So we were mostly taking into account the changes in behaviour of components as they aged. Um, I also planned and applied for the funding for an upgrade of the sensors and the control software. Um, so we've just finished installing this new system, um, which um, along with some um, various contractors I designed. Um, and that means that we have, we have replaced the now um, obsolete original control software um, with like an industry standard smart building system, um, which means that we can see in real time how everything is performing. Um, and we can make tweaks to the control software to optimize things. Um, it's also meant, uh, interestingly, it's also meant that I can actually control the system from home, which of course has been really important during what's happened this year. Um, so that was really fortunate timing. Uh, we pretty much finished installing the system um, in January 2020, so it, it's, it, it was here just in time. Um, so the other thing is that our new wireless sensors um, can communicate better than the previous ones could. And there are two big advantages to that. So 
Firstly, it means that we can reach more locations around the ship. So we can really get an idea for, um, of how that air is flowing. So I showed you a picture earlier of the air on the outside surface of the ship, um, but we have two dehumidifiers and the other one is inside the ship. Um, so the air flow path on the inside of the ship is actually much more complicated than it is outside of the ship because we've got all of the different rooms and compartments and we've got sections behind wall panels. Um, and so now um, I can stash these sensors basically anywhere I can reach um, and I can get a really good feel for how the humidity of the air is varying around the different parts of the ship. So that then um, obviously opens up more options in terms of understanding how the system works. Um, but as well as being able to reach more locations, um, it means we also get a reading sent back to the computer more often. Um, and this is really useful when it comes to fine tuning the controls. So deciding uh, what we need to do with the heat that removes the um, moisture from the desiccant. Um, so if we get a reading back from the ship more often, um, then we can apply greater precision to those controls. Um, and that's really powerful. Um, and that's going to help us. So we're now we're now collecting much more data about this about this system than we previously were, um, which is going to help us to make decisions about how we're going to conserve the ship in the future. Um, so one of our aspirations, of course, is to support the city of Bristol's aspiration um, to reach net zero. So um, I've mentioned before that um, this is quite an ambitious thing to do from an energy perspective. Um, so what I'm hoping we're going to be able to do is um, to borrow some analysis techniques um, from other parts of engineering. Um, so I've been reading a little bit about um, smart meters and about the tech that's used to process the signals from smart meters. Um, and so by using those sorts of techniques, we can then um, start to look at our own energy consumption um, and look at tweaks that we can make to minimize that. Um, and then obviously the next stage to that is to work out how we can decarbonize it. Um, but the very important first stage is, is of course to minimize it so that we're um, doing that as efficiently as we can. So one of the one of the things I kind of hope to get across um, really during this talk is that um, although this ship and this project is totally unique, um, the skills required to work on it are not unique. They're the skills that can be built up um, in other areas of engineering. Um, none of the engineers who designed the system to conserve the SS Great Britain had ever worked on caring for a Victorian steamship before, um, but they were able to take their knowledge and their experience gained in other industries, um, and they were able to adapt and combine those ideas to develop this totally unique system. Um, and that's one of the things that makes me really excited to be an engineer. So we developed this set of tools and techniques um, which we can then apply in a whole variety of different situations, whether we're creating the Arizona desert in a leaky old Bristol dock, or whether we're building the world's tallest skyscraper, or whether we're putting humans into space. Like so many things that we see or use every day um, have got these incredible engineering systems inside them. And engineers are always borrowing ideas from, from different industries to make those things work. So, I hope that next time you're in Bristol, you'll come and see Brunel's Iron Ship because of course, the reason we put in so much effort to conserve her um, is so that she can inspire and entertain visitors and hopefully inspire some of the engineers of the future. Thank you, Nicola, that was really great. Thanks, that was really good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have got a few minutes for questions and we got a few questions. So are you okay if I kind of have one or two questions for you? Yep, fire away. Earlier on, you mentioned um, Brunel's engine being space inefficient and being moved out. Um, there was a question saying that the SS Great Britain had, you know, had had many configurations in, its, in her life. Yeah. Um, is there a what's a, is there a kind of a target configuration for the for the con conservation work, and does that cause any debate? Should we say? Yeah, um, that's a that's a really good question. So. Um, so when you're conserving an object, what you're trying to do is you're trying to preserve whatever, whatever the thing is about the object that makes her special. So I've talked a bit about the original iron. Um, and as it happens, um, the SS Great Britain, because she um, was involved in various accidents and because she did different jobs and she was owned by different people, um, she was actually completely internally refitted 
um, multiple times. So the SS Great Britain's original engine um, and original propeller lasted only a really tiny um, fraction of her original life. So when she came back from the Falkland Islands, um, there was almost nothing left inside um, that was in any way original. So the, the only thing that was original was that iron hull. Um, so um, the team then were kind of left with the question, um, like, what do we do to the inside of the ship um, to make her the most representative of the, the period of history that is going to be of most interest to our visitors. Um, so what we've actually got inside, um, there's, no, there's nothing at all original inside the ship, apart from one bathtub, which bizarrely was on board the ship when she came back. So nothing else that's, that's on board the ship is original. Everything inside the ship is recreated. Mm. Um, and that then gives us the... Um, so that then kind of gives us, I don't want to say artistic license, because actually um, the interpretation team at the SS Great Britain have worked really hard on making sure that although everything on board is recreated, it's as authentic as it can possibly be. So our collection, so we have, as well as having the ship, we've also got um, two museums on site um, and we've got an archive. Um, and inside our archive, most of our collection um, actually consists of paper things so we've got um we've got logs um we've got a lot of letters that were written from passengers on board the ship um and we've also got things like diaries that were kept by passengers on board the ship um things like menus from the dining saloon um and it's from that collection that we've been able to kind of build up this picture and in fact in some cases people people obviously had to while away lots of time on board and drew quite detailed pictures of what the inside of the ship was like so we're really fortunate to have that information um, so what we've got on the so what we've got on the outside of the ship is we've got a recreation of the first propeller um, and we've got a recreation of the original engine um, but the rest of the ship um, we've decked out how it would have been for her um, her voyages to Australia, which were actually the second part of her life. Yeah. Um, so we've sort of got a fusion of two, two different yeah. um, configurations. Awesome. Um, so what, what we've tried to do is we've tried to put together the most technically interesting thing for the engine and the propeller and the most um, socially interesting thing for the rest of the ship. That's interesting. Um, just a quick one. You talked about the um, desiccant being a big circular thing that rotated how how fast does that rotate uh it's one rpm all right uh, so it's two meters in diameter and it rotates at one revolution per minute okay that's reasonably quick then yeah uh, somebody else was asking that th there are some ships which are preserved in the water they mentioned the hms warrior in portsmouth mm. i think which is in the water i mean is that are those are those kind of vessels going to so for the potential fate that you described for the SS Great Britain? Um, I was getting some really good questions today. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, depends on, it depends on how far in the future you're looking at. It is only a matter of time. Um, but yeah. HMS Warrior has got much, much longer than the SS Great Britain had. Right. Um, and the reason for that is because um, although the Warrior is not that much newer, um, first of all, the process for making wrought iron um, had, had actually come along quite a lot um, mm. in that time. So um, I would expect the iron on the Warrior to um, probably have fewer impurities and fewer air bubbles and inclusions. Um, but also, secondly, um, HMS Warrior, um, the hull plates on Warrior are much, much thicker because right. she was a military ship. So she was mm. designed to, um, you know, she was designed to with standard battering. Um, yeah. So that's the second thing. And then thirdly, um, famously, the HMS Warrior didn't really do an awful lot. Um, whereas, whereas the SS Great Britain <laughs> has sailed, sailed more than a million nautical miles in four different configurations. So um, yeah, event, eventually they're gonna have all, the same, all of the same problems, but um, probably not in our lifetime. And just a quick one from me before we sign off. Do you know why they scuttled her in the Falklands? Was that a question of out of sight, out of mind, or was it? Uh, um, no, it was just where she happened to be at the time. So her, <laughs> the last, the last place she ever sailed was um, to San Francisco, um, and she was, and so this was before the Panama Canal. So she was rounding Cape Horn, um, and she got caught in a storm, 
um, and she wasn't viable to repair. So she was sold to the Falkland Islands Company, um, who then used her as a warehouse. Yeah. Um, and it was only once she was too expensive to keep watertight that, that she was then scuttled. Okay. So for her last, um, her last kind of paid job in her career was for the Falklands Company. Okay, thank you. Well, we just got to four o'clock. That was a really brilliant talk, Nicola. I've got lots of people saying it in the chat, if you can see. I know when we talked before the talk, you mentioned you get lots of school children visiting but to look at the SS Great Britain. And I'm sure they must get, have a fascinating time hearing all about her and her, and her history. And I suspect the school children here in Sidmouth would feel the same if they could, if they could uh, um, have the pleasure of the talk. Um, so thank you very much indeed. And thank you for making the time to give us the, you know, this talk today. Um, thanks also to everybody for attending. Um, John's just put the final slide on. Um, we will be sending out a link for a survey form. Um, so if you're able to give us any comments on, on, you know, on the talk today, we'd be very much appreciative, appreciative of that. Um, and then just finally, this we're about halfway, we're about halfway through the Science Festival. Um, the next talk will be tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, and it's a talk in combination with the Arts, um, with the Arts Society of Sidmouth on the, um, and the talk is called Cape Farewell. So 11 o'clock tomorrow, Cape Farewell, talk in conjunction with the Arts Society of Sidmouth. So if you'd like to hear that talk as well, you can sign up on the Eventbrite um, web website. Once again, thank you to Nicola, very much appreciated. And thank you to everybody for attending today. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. That was really good, thank you. I echo our thanks as well. Yeah. By coincidence, Alan, both Penny and I were there um, when they brought the Great Britain into Bristol, um, right. <laughs> which must be a fairly, fairly long chance. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, yeah. I actually remember that picture you showed of them towing her up the under the Clifton Ascension Bridge, what, yeah. 50 years ago? It was, on, it was featured on the BBC, I think, wasn't it, on, on her anniversary? Yeah, so we were supposed to have um, we were supposed to have a like a celebration uh, this year as part of the Bristol Harbour Festival, but of course all of the everything in person's been um, put on hold. So I think we're going to try and do something in twenty twenty one. But of course we'd already prepared a lot of um, the media and that sort of stuff. So um, we were kind of trying to work out whether, um, obviously, with all the other news that was going on. Um, yeah trying to share snippets um, as, as and when appropriate. And fortunately that um, July was a bit of a, a bit of a lull in yeah. the current situation. So that there was the opportunity for us to share some stuff, which was great. I think we got some, yeah, we got some national press coverage, which is, which is always nice to have. Absolutely. Yeah. That was really good. Excellent. So what do we do now, John? Do we, we simply wave goodbye to each other and close the Zoom call down? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that. Yes. Um, no, I, I have, I will now stop the recording um, and I'll save the chat, which um, we can, um, well, I'll pass on to Rita at some point. Uh, we've got to work out how we're going to do that and then we'll get the, um, the recording loaded up onto the website. So. That's the plan. I think we got through most of the questions. There were, there were more questions, but quite a few of them you actually covered later on in the talk, because I know Chris asked about how the outside of the hull was protected. And then, of course, you then showed later on the picture of the hot air going through the outside and everything. So, uh, so I, I managed to kind of filter those out <laughs> rather than answer, asking the question you already, already answered in the talk. I also asked whether what else was was conserved. Was it just the hull? And then you answered that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> tick 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 tick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that you asked about the rivets as well. So we think we think there are about two hundred thousand rivets, um, and those are iron as well. So they yeah. they were all hand all hand made. So the other question I ask is where are, where are all the chloride ions hiding? <laughs> Inside. 
Well, but but the, but the, they then no, but iron is not porous, so so at least it's normally it's not porous. So so um, there's a surface layer presumably, but after that, I don't understand how there's a sort of such a large concentration mm. of, of steroid um, ions. So I think available. how I think how it works is that they become involved in um, there are various different corrosion mechanisms involving the chlorides, and and I think what happens is that um, there are kind of intermediate compounds. Um, along the corrosion process. Um, there are actually some papers that talk a bit in, the, so I'm obviously not a chemist, um, there are some papers that talk about the chemistry in a bit more detail, which are all available to download on our website. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, have, we have a it's kind of in, intermediate <laughs> products. <laughs> intermediate <laughs> products is probably the best way to describe it. I suppose as she was scuttled, the top part of the, the ship did get exposed to some seawater, but for a short period of time. So, yeah, oh, and she was scuttled in quite shallow water as well, so. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. I think um, you can have a drive. Are oh, you driving home now, Nicola? Uh, cycling, yep. Cycling <laughs> home. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> thank you very much again. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Terrific. No, very much so. Yeah, it's great. That's good. Thanks, then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Come and find yeah. you. Bye. Yeah, come and Bye. visit. Let, yeah. me know, let me know if you're coming to visit. And, um, yeah, but, but both yeah. my daughters live in, live in Bristol, so I, I'm often in Bristol. Yeah, no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got a, yeah. I've got a big book which is full of corrosion papers, so you can read about the rest of the <laughs> You first, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter's a chemist too, at least, at least they started oh. the oh, well, degrees. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Right. Thanks bye. a lot. Right. Bye, bye. now. Bye.